Hello and welcome to our continuing series called Learning with Luke. It is our two-year journey through the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts. We are in the second half of Luke chapter 15. Uh, this is the third of the three lost uh, parables. Last week we read the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. This week we have the parable of the lost son or what is sometimes called the prodigal son. And so this is Luke uh, 15, starting at verse 11, going through verse 32, and I invite you to listen for the word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region and there he squandered his wealth in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that region, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that region, who sent him to the fields to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field and as he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command yet. You have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a very well-known story and um, there are two parts of this I just want to make some brief comments about. Uh, the first is a reminder that our cultural context and background can often shape how we read the story. And I read about a uh, seminary professor who got very interested in this story and would read it to different cultural groups and see what they thought about it. And um, he read it to a group of 
Russians, a group of Americans, and a group of Africans. And what are you hearing in the story? What's going on? And the question he really focused in on is why was the son in such desperate circumstances? What was going on that he found himself at the bottom of the barrel, at, at, at his wit's end? And the Americans largely, and I've tested this in churches that I've been the pastor of, and it almost always is what is offered, is why was the son in such dire straits? And the answer is because he squandered his money. He did immoral and bad things. He saw prostitutes and gambled and drank and whatever else it was that he did. And this makes sense. Americans have a very high sense of personal morality. It's sort of an irony of our culture. On the one hand, it's a, it's a very sexually charged culture. Um, the, we use um, you know, scantily clad women and very suggestive things to sell items. Um, you know, we, we celebrate excessive eating and drinking, and yet we have this very puritanical streak as well. And so it makes sense that Americans would say that's what it is. And a lot of people are sure that's the only reason that's given. But then he asked a group of Russians, why was this man in such dire straits? And they point to, uh, it is verse uh, 14. It says, when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the region and he began to be in need. Russia is a part of the world that has experienced these historic and um, cyclical famines. Uh, it's large population that normally is fed well, but when there's a couple of bad crops, um, it not only puts people in peril, it ends up killing millions and millions of people. So for Russians, one of the great perils of life is famine. And it's a regular peril. And when they read this story, sure, he squandered his money, but it was that famine. Famines will do you in. And so they focus in on that. They're not like Americans who focus in on the, the immorality of the young man, in this case, they focus in on, on externalities, on things that are beyond our control, because that has shaped so much of their thinking and their, their way of, of understanding how the world works. And then the same professor turned to a group of Africans and said, why was this young man in such dire straits? And largely, they focused in on verse 16. This is after he's been sent to the field to give up, uh, to feed the pigs. And it says he gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. Africans tend to have this very um, high cultural value on communal support and living. Um, it's often said in the West, the way we understand who we are is the phrase from Rene Descartes uh, in Latin, it is cogito ergo sum in English, I think, therefore I am. Because I have my own agency, I know I exist as a person. In Africa, it's often said that uh, the way you know that you exist is we are, therefore I am. I am because I am part of a larger collective, a collective that um, supports one another, that takes care of one another, that protects one another. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when Africans read this gospel, this uh, parable, they sure they hear that the man squandered his money and sure there was a famine and there, those all happen in Africa too. Those are not foreign to them. But the thing that makes life livable uh, that, that, that enables us to not just survive, but to thrive, is that we have the support of our whole community. We are in this together. And they focus in on that part. He was in such dire straits because no one would help him. And then the question is, so who's right? Is it the Americans with their emphasis on morality, the Russians with their emphasis on famine, with Africans on their emphasis on communal support and living? And the answer is everybody is right and nobody has the complete story because we are inclined given our, our, the frameworks that we grow up in, the cultural ones that we don't even know we've received. They just, they're as natural to us as breathing oxygen, but it colors the way we read scripture. And that is why it is so important that we read scripture together. Um, 
My wife, Linda, reads passages that involve women in scripture very differently than I do because she has, um, has, has tremendous gifts that come to her from her femininity, from her uh, being a woman uh, in the world and in our culture, but she also experiences limitations. Uh, she experiences barriers. She has experienced insults that I have never, never, ever experienced. She one time was applying for a position as a pastor, and one of the people on the search committee, a man, said, well, that was really helpful to hear from you. When does the swimsuit competition begin? Since then, we've always, uh, I, I mean, she was just shocked. She didn't know what to say. Her jaw just dropped, and, and everybody felt awkward about it, and they let the moment pass. Later on, we realized what she should have said is, oh, that's okay. I don't need to see you in your swimsuit. But the problem, of course, with those phrases is they are meant to discombobulate us, and she was discombobulated in that moment, and, and nobody else thought to say anything. No one has ever asked me about swimsuits when I have... Um, interviewed for a job. No one's asked me about childbearing or about raising children or any of that. Um, and so women, both with, with some real positives and assets and also with some real uh, barriers and obstacles, have a perspective on Scripture and on who God is and who, on who we are in relationship to God. And the same is true of people who have grown up in different parts of the world in different cultures, who speak different languages. I mean, language alone can, can shape how we think about this. In English, the order of words is very precise. Uh, it's why we laugh at Yoda in, in the Star Wars movies. Uh, very good doing you are, and, and it sounds just wrong to us, but in other languages, you can move the words around, and its meaning is given by the way you have uh, verb conjugations, the declensions of nouns, uh, you decline, that's called the uh, declension, is, is the same thing as a conjugation of a verb, but you do it with a noun, and it tells you where in the sentence it belongs, even if it's not put there. That changes the way we think. I mean, just think about people who only speak sign language. Their language is in true symbols. They have symbols for words, not just symbols for letters. Uh, so so this, this passage is such a, a, an important window for us that we need each other. And it's again a reminder how powerful and how important the congregation of First Presbyterian Church of Garland is because God has gathered such a wide array of people. And our goal is not to line up everybody into one way of thinking or doing or being as if we could do that anyway. But instead we have this amazing and marvelous opportunity not only to learn from one another, but to grow with one another into something new and unique and beautiful. And I, I, I so love this parable because it has those three different reasons why the young man is in trouble, and the parable holds them all together. He made poor choices, circumstances were against him, and the community didn't support him. All of those are important to how we live our lives. Um, and yet we tend to focus on one because of the frames that we have grown up in. The second thing I just want to make a short comment on is the scandal of grace. Uh, my wife Linda had a parishioner uh, who, who detested um, deathbed conversions. Well, why would God let them in? You know, I've had to do all the work and they just get a free pass. Sounds a lot like the son in the uh, story of the, the lost son or the prodigal son, doesn't it? Why does he get all this? I've got nothing. And of course, when the father comes, he says, everything I have had that I have has always been yours. You have always been in this favored position because you didn't stray. You've always been close to me. And now we rejoice because your son who squandered it all who, 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 and then had to, to grovel his way back. He didn't even have to do that, but he did. He got as low as anyone could be. He hit rock bottom. He is alive to us again. But there is that scandal of grace. How much will God forgive? 
I mean, I think most of us assume, well, my, my smaller minor sins, sure he'll forgive, but what about the murderer? What about the person who has done terrible things? God surely can't forgive all of that, or don't I get some other reward? And over and over again in the gospel, Jesus refuses to, to weigh who's going to get more. There's that wonderful parable of the workers who come uh, to the vineyard, some at 8 in the morning, some at 12 noon, and some at 4 in the afternoon. And when they are done, they all get paid the same. And those who came early are outraged. It's like, we worked harder than they did. Why do they get the same as us? And the answer, I think, is twofold. It's in this story, too. One is we're not God, and we don't set the rules, and we don't make the calculus that, that will determine uh, how grace is doled out. And because grace is actually grace, a free gift that none of us deserve or merit, it will be given fully to all. But the second thing is working in the vineyard is the reward. The, 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 my sorrow for people who have deathbed conversions is not, oh gosh, well they get in and I had to do all the work, but they missed so much joy. They missed so much beauty. They missed so much forgiveness. They, they missed the community. They missed uh, the embraces. I think of all the saints who I have had the privilege to know and then to uh, commend their spirits to God throughout my 33 years of ministry. And I am so blessed to have known them. Some are people who are known to members of the First Presbyterian Church congregation, people like Roy Ann Ramsey and Ralph Veeman, uh, people like Kay Dams and Linda Hicks. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And people from churches uh, that I have served since the uh, early 1990s. Um, such a privilege, such a privilege to labor in the vineyard, such a privilege not to have strayed, but to always have been in the house and to know that all of God's riches already are given to me. But it is a scandal, and we do have to sometimes get over it because uh, while God does not keep score the way we do, we keep score. As I tell people, I still have a list. Um, and I thank God that my list is not God's list, that God does not hate the same people that I do. Because if God did, I would quickly fall on my own list as well. But God's grace encompasses everyone, including me and including you. May you be blessed by that grace on this day. <music>